So I'd like to thank uh, John and the organizers also for the opportunity to be here today and uh, to speak to you about some of the work that we've been doing. Um, we've been interested in gene expression uh, and the role of enhancers in that process for some time now. And uh, this interest, is, of course, was boosted a few years ago, uh, as for many people, um, as a result of the development of chip-chip analysis and all the variations on chip-seq analysis that have come out in part due to the uh, uh, great work from, from the en ENCODE consortium. And we, of course, have taken advantage of that uh, technique as well. So I just want to uh, acknowledge people uh, that have been involved in some of the studies I'm going to show you uh, uh, first here. And I want to primarily uh, acknowledge uh, Mark Meyer, who's done much of the work that I'm going to talk about. Uh, along with various other uh, individuals in this, in this group. I'll talk a little bit about some of the work that uh, we have done with uh, Charles O'Brien and acknowledge some of the analytical work that we've done uh, through Homer with Chris Benner, who uh, uh, at that time was actually working with Chris Glass, and we're appreciative of that effort. Now, what I would like to do first off, however, is, is uh, pose this sort of question, and that is why we study enhancers. And, um, of course, I, I don't really need to say an awful lot about that uh, to this group, but I just want to point out several things, and that is, of course, gene expression and cell phenotype are primarily governed by enhancers, and so a detailed knowledge of mechanisms of regulation uh, are necessary literally for every gene uh, whose misexpression is known to uh, result in, in human disease, and this comes about from the obvious uh, idea that if, if there's a, a human route to uh, a gene knockout in mice that results in a phenotype, that's an actually an important gene. And knowledge of that regulatory uh, capability is, is uh, uh, very important. Also disease regulatory knowledge regarding genes that play a role in disease progression, and there are a number of those as well. And finally, we've talked a number, we talked about this, is regulatory knowledge uh, about genes that are linked to RFLPs, SNPs, or indels that increase the risk for disease. All of these are misexpression examples uh, that are very important, uh, and uh, therefore, we actually think that it's important to actually understand uh, the direct relationships between uh, this regulation and these, disease, these, these genes, because uh, these details could provide some selective opportunities for, for uh, therapeutics. So I want to uh, just, first of all, give you a couple of slides on our entry point into uh, gene regulation, and that has to do with uh, the vitamin D hormone. And just to remind you that while um, vitamin D is known to regulate mineral homeostasis, uh, and it's involved in, certainly in skeletal uh, homeostasis, it has a lot of other effects, uh, some related to the immune system, uh, cardiovascular system, and so forth. And so. Uh, it's actually, uh, vitamin D is, is certainly uh, uh, plays a role in, in biology that's, that's far beyond that, that is related to uh, calcium and phosphorus uh, homeostasis. All of these activities of the vitamin D, of course, are regulated by, uh, are mediated by the vitamin D uh, receptor. And in fact, while we had some understanding very early on that vitamin D might be part of an endocrine system, uh, it took the cloning of the vitamin D receptor uh, in the late 80s uh, to, to really identify it as, as a true member of the steroid nuclear receptor family of genes, uh, and uh, in so doing, uh, provide a bona fide uh, membership in this family. And the vitamin D receptor, uh, through domain analysis that was done at that time, suggested the amino terminus had the DNA binding domain. The business end of the molecule was, in fact, the C-terminal end. And the effects of the ligand were to uh, re, uh, alter the configuration of this uh, C-terminal end to uh, open an act or conform an activation domain we called AF2 uh, that led to uh, activation of gene expression. Um, this is simply a... Uh, a, a uh, crystallography study that we did with a ligand binding domain to understand how the vitamin D receptor actually worked. And other people have done this as well. Uh, and this has allowed us to understand where the, the contacts for 125D3 in this pocket, uh, 
uh, this, the activation domain surface with this peptide was identified uh, and so forth. So this has allowed us to uh, begin to think about designing analogs, although that hasn't actually gone all that well. Now, I want to come back just for a minute and, and remind you that uh, the primary role of vitamin D has been in calcium and phosphorus homeostasis. And what you can see here is that vitamin D plays a really a very complex role uh, in, the, in the intestine, kidney, and bone to regulate this uh, and maintain extracellular calcium and phosphorus levels. And it also does it by regulating PTH levels uh, through the parathyroid gland. It also regulates through bone, it regulates FGF. PTH is primarily uh, involved in, in the calcium regulation, whereas FGF23 is, is involved in phosphate. And we've been particularly interested in the bone areas simply because vitamin D actually can mediate uh, not only bone remodeling, but of course it also, the skeleton is actually the source of calcium and phosphorus in, in situations where uh, there's a dietary deficiency of either of these minerals. So this is actually a very important area that, that uh, needs to be understood and we've uh, focused uh, to some extent on that. Now, when we, uh, in, the, in the 90s, we, we began to understand three basic principles of the vitamin D receptor, and I'll quickly go through these. The first one is that the vitamin D receptor interacts on DNA with a partner called RxR. Uh, RxR plays a role in many other receptors as well, but it's a heterodimer that functions. It functions on DNA, and we were able to identify response elements uh, that were comprised of two hexanucleotide half sites. Uh, separated by three base pairs. So these two principles were important. This is a uh, cryo-EM structure uh, done by uh, uh, Nino Morass and his colleagues. Uh, so this is sort of a contemporary view of it. But the third principle was that the vitamin D receptor, as many nuclear receptors and, and other transcription factors, simply function to recruit chromatin active co-regulatory proteins uh, groups of proteins, and this is three of them here. I won't go through them. There are many, many of these, uh, and we yet don't understand uh, all of them and their individual functions, but I, I think we're, we're, we're getting there to understand at least some of them. Now, the problem with this is that this was a very receptor-centric view of life, and that is because we were studying the receptor on a couple of genes uh, that we had begun to explore, and the problem with that was, was we, it was very limited to these particular genes. And so during the, when, when uh, the uh, unbiased methods uh, such as CHIP-CHIP and CHIP-seq analysis came about, we tried to take advantage of that to begin to understand uh, the properties of vitamin D action in, in, on a genome-wide basis, uh, sort of an overarching principle. And again, we focused on osteoblasts. Uh, as bone forming cells, again, because uh, they, they play a, a large role in regulating the remodeling of bone, but also because we could actually look in vitro, uh, we could actually look at the differentiation process and compare different stages of osteoblast uh, uh, cells, and, uh, much like uh, uh, Evan Rosen has, has told you about with respect to adipocytes. In any event, so we did an experiment where we took uh, osteoblasts and just treated them in the absence and presence of 125 and did a CHIP-seq analysis uh, looking at the cystrome for the VDR. And here what you can see is that there's about 1,000 genes, uh, binding sites for the vitamin D receptor in the absence of ligand, about 7,000 or so uh, in the presence of ligand, clearly suggesting that in the case of the vitamin D receptor is that the hormone is very uh, active in promoting DNA binding. If we look at RxR, we can see the same thing. It's a much bigger cystrome, probably be because it has uh, greater uh, activities with other receptors. Uh, but in case uh, when you add 125D3, you do see that activity. And the important aspect of this is if you actually cross these over, you actually look at the peak intersects, you will see that about 4,000 of these sites uh, have both VDR and RxR. Uh, certainly, these, this would support then the idea that RxR is a partner. Uh, if you do a de novo analysis, uh, motif finding analysis um, in pre-osteoblasts as well as osteoblasts, these are early cells, these are di fully differentiated mineralizing cells, you can see that you, you see the vitamin D receptor RxR uh, motif, which is AGGTCA, uh, two, two AGGTCA motifs separated by 
uh, three base pairs. Uh, and in fact, you can see that in, in both cases. There are some additional pro uh, motifs that are found in these elements, in, in these enhancers as well. Now, this was the most interesting observation, and we've talked about this already, and that is the, the discovery, in fact, that, bi that the binding sites for the vitamin D receptor, as well as many other transcription factors, are, in fact, located distal to the promoter rather than near promoters. In fact, the bulk of them are either intronic or energenic, and this has had profound effects on our ability to understand the process. Finally, uh, when we look at pre-osteoblasts and osteoblasts, uh, here's the VDR uh, systrome. What you see is a tremendous contraction of the um, number of binding sites of the systrome following differentiation. And this actually has uh, some important ramifications as well. Now, we were asking then, we asked then whether the change in this transcriptome had, or the, this systrome had an important role to play in gene regulation. We did a microarray analysis of pre-osteoblasts and then the mature osteoblasts, and we could see some rather dramatic effects. This is a microarray uh, analysis of, 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 this, of the, the gene expression. We've done uh, extensive RNA-seq uh, since that time. But in fact, what you can see is both up and down regulated genes uh, are changed dramatically as a result. So it's pretty clear that, in fact, here's the up-regulated up genes. Uh, and here are the down-regulated genes. You can see the contraction in both cases. So it's pretty clear that there is a change in gene expression uh, in response to 125 as a function of differentiation. Now, one of the genes that actually goes down that's suppressed by 125 because 125D3 is trophic for the vitamin D receptor and autoregulates it is, in fact, the vitamin D receptor itself. So it's suppressed in its expression levels, and that has a clear impact on the expression of the gene, but the real question here is why uh, all this occurs. And in fact, one of the things that we noticed was that there's still a number of, of, of genes that are targets uh, in the mature osteoblast. Uh, and in fact, if you look at this, this is actually quite interesting. You see a tremendous change in, uh, in the regulatory uh, ca capability of 125D3 between early and late cells. So for example, here in call 2A1, a tremendous downregulation by vitamin D, but almost no, but a, a tremendous suppression in the case of the mature osteoblast and almost no regulation, probably a result of the loss of vitamin D receptor binding here. And in fact, if you look at this chip seek analysis of this, you can see uh, that there's a complete loss of the vitamin D receptor binding activity in this gene. However, if you look at uh, a, a couple of other genes, this is an interesting one, ENPP1 and 3, which are right together, uh, there is a primary uh, uh, enhancer that we believe regulates both of the, the expression of both of these genes. Again, you can see there's an incredible increase in responsivity to 125, modest changes in basal level as well. And finally, if you look at this last gene here, you can see almost no expression and then tremendous expression. And these don't really correlate with the levels of the vitamin D receptor that are bound here uh, in, in each of these particular cases. So the real question here is why are these immature cells uh, much more sensitive to 125D3 in, in, in a couple of these cases um, and the, that they're able to regulate, uh, but even though the, the peak height, for example, is not near as high as it is. And the, the scale over here you can see is actually rather dramatically different. So there are many reasons for this, and we don't really understand it all, but just let me point out a couple of possibilities. The first of all is that the, we had some clues as to the idea that there were other transcription factors that were present in these, uh, in, at these enhancers. And so we actually did a chip seek of, of CEBP beta and RUNX2. Now, RUNX2 is a master regulator of the osteoblast, is involved in chromatin uh, opening, and CEBP beta is, a, a, is involved in chromatin remodeling. And what you see here is about 17,000 sites, 1,700 sites uh, where VDR and RX are actually bound are actually co-occupied by uh, RUNX2 and CEBP beta. And all this motif finding analysis reveals uh, pretty much the same thing. And what this says when you do a further biomet uh, bioinformatic analysis is, in fact, that there's an organization to these motifs uh, in which, if you look at on a broad spectrum, you can see 
that there's an organization where the vitamin D receptor is bound between RUNX and CEBP beta. And the, the approximation here is quite close. There's just a few base pairs in between. So we've called this the osteoblast enhancer complex. Uh, it's not consistent uh, across the entire uh, uh, genome here, but it does suggest that these other players, RUNX2 and CEBP beta, could have an enormous impact on the regulation mediated by 125D3. Now, the second area that I don't have time to really go into is the, uh, the genetic and the epigenetic changes uh, that occur during differentiation. And just to, to summarize these, uh, differentiation and trans differentiation as we and, and the ENCODE group has characterized fully is, is uh, that there are significant changes in histone modifications uh, at selected gene loci, and those are the ones, of course, that are changing uh, during the differentiation process. The enhancers are highlighted by signature enhancer uh, histone modifications uh, that change as a result of the change of these genes during differentiation. Um, these changes in histone marks and the regulatory factors can contribute to the responsivity uh, to 125D3. And in fact, we've also noticed that 125 and other hormones provoke changes in these histone modifications, particularly at the level of uh, histone acetylation that, uh, again, are very histone uh, gene selective uh, for 125D3. So we th think that these are clearly changing the, uh, the, the epigenome surrounding the genes that are actually changed and influence uh, vitamin D response. So this is a list of uh, overarching principles of vitamin D-mediated gene regulation that we have identified. I just want to reiterate uh, three of these. One, the distal binding sites, uh, the locations of these, because they create the complexity that we heard in the last talk and uh, in most of the talks, distal regulation where uh, a promoter proximal uh, binding site can be inferred to regulate a gene that's sitting right next to it, but the distal regulation makes it very, very difficult. If 40% of the binding sites for some of these uh, molecules is two, uh, greater than 250 kilobases away, it makes it, it, it very difficult to assay. Uh, epigenetically, uh, there are epigenetic signature marks largely identified by the ENCODE group, um, and these are really very important, and they, they mediate a dynamic uh, nature to the genes themselves. And finally, the vitamin D systems are highly dynamic based upon the differentiation process. And we also believe, uh, and, uh, and I think this is certainly true, that disease can alter these effects as well, and so these are very important. Now I want to go through, um, uh, I want to go back to one of the genes that we noticed that was regulated and tell you how we look at enhancers and their activities and show that, in fact, these enhancers are directly linked to the regulation of the genes. There are many bioinformatic ways, but to our way of thinking, at least at this point, they really are not definitive. So we have looked at MMP13 as another gene. We've looked at many genes, but this is one I want to give you an example of. It's regulated by vitamin D and differentiation. You can see the process over here in the early cells. Not much regulation here a bit. But when you, uh, when you uh, differentiate these cells, tremendous increase in baseline and then a tremendous increase in vitamin D response. Now this is a gene called collagenase, uh, MMP13 or collagenase 3, degrades extracellular collagen. Um, it is regulated by a whole host of different uh, factors. Uh, it's uh, certainly aberrantly regulated in nearly every cancer or disease with fibrotic complications. And importantly, it's also regulated in, and important in atherosclerosis. Finally, it's interesting, and people, many people here will probably agree, uh, previous work on the regulation is focused almost exclusively within the three or 400 bases near the promoter region of the gene. So when we looked at the ChIP-seq analysis that we uh, had, had derived from some of our earlier work in uh, early and, and, and late osteoblast, here's the gene itself. We looked at the vitamin D receptor, RUNX2 and CEBP beta, and a series of uh, histone modifications. And I think it's pretty clear. Here is the promoter region uh, right here, which there is some activity. But I think you can see there are three other regions, uh, 10, 20, and 30 kilobases. The 10K region binds the vitamin D receptor. 
20K region and 30K region bind the, the CEBP beta. And then RUNX is bound to the 30K uh, distal uh, region as well. And all these are highlighted by marks that contribute to the idea of, uh, uh, of, of a histone signature. So we were pretty convinced, in fact, that, uh, that, it, it, that these were enhancers. The question was whether they were mediating the activity of MMP13. And so what we have done is actually to use the CRISPR-Cas9 uh, system to um, generate a series of daughter cell lines from the, per, from, from, the, from the host cell line and actually look at those uh, and look at the consequence by, of deleting the enhancers themselves. And here are the ones that we've, we've actually created. We created a promoter deletion with these, uh, the, the, this uh, approximately 400 base pairs. Um, we deleted about 200 base pairs around the 10K region that removes the vitamin D responsive elements. There's two of them we've identified. And then we removed the 30K region, uh, again, that contains the RUNX uh, binding site. We also knocked out the vitamin D receptor by that same means, and we also uh, uh, knocked out RUNX as well to see whether there was a correlation between these measurements uh, and these measurements. So this is the data. It's a little bit complicated, but uh, let me go through it uh, uh, quickly. And that is, so here's the wild type cells, and there are several different clones because there, there tends to be some variability, and we're trying to be very cautious about this. This is basal activity. This is the activity in the presence of 125B3. The first thing you can see is when you knock out the 10K hormonal regulated enhancer, you completely lose vitamin D induction, but what you gain actually surprisingly is the ability to 125D3 to actually suppress this gene. And I'll come back to this uh, in, in, a, in a little bit. Um, if you look at the promoter region, you lose a little bit of basal activity, but it's still inducible by 125D3 and the fold is about the same. But we're measuring RNA levels, MMP13 RNA levels in this cell, and of course, slight, uh, aside from the uh, genomic modifications, we're not adding or subtracting anything to these cells. Okay, so if you look, for example, at um, the d deletion of the, of the minus 30K region, now you see a complete loss of basal activity from that 30K region. So, uh, and, and in fact, if you then look at, uh, but there's some, uh, still there's some regulation of the vitamin D uh, itself, so that still seems to be a bit operable. When you look at a knock, RUNX knockout or the VDR knockout of these cells, those activities generally reflect the activity that's seen with the knockout of the two enhancers. So this is the expansion of that, just to show you, here's the basal level, here's the ability of 125 to suppress, uh, and you can see that th this is an expanded version of just these sets you can see a tremendous uh, a, a change. So we actually think that, there, that these are, are important observations with respect to MMP13, and they establish a direct linkage between the enhancers that we've identified here and um, this gene. So I said that vitamin D turns into a suppressor. Uh, we're, we don't understand it entirely, but here's the model that we're, that we're looking at. Here's MMP13. The direct effects of vitamin D to induce that um, to induce that gene, but vitamin D has very potent down regulatory effects on RUNX2 on the RUNX2 gene itself, and that and that also in turn has a direct effect in suppressing Ostrix, which is another key um, osteoblast transcription factor as well. So what we think is happening is when we knock out the vitamin D response itself, then the impact of the vitamin D system on down-regulating a key basal regulator, which is RUNX2, leads to that uh, kind of a suppression. Uh, and we're following up on this, uh, but it has, we believe it actually has significant uh, implications for other RUNX2 and vitamin D target genes, because you can imagine all sorts of things in genes where there's a different uh, sort of uh, arrangement of regulation. So this is a summary of what we, of, of what we uh, think is going on in this chromatin interaction model, where this is the, uh, uh, the uh, promoter region itself uh, here. And we've, we've centered the 30K region here because it's a primary player. Uh, we have the 20 and the 10 and, and the promoter region interacting. And the reason we have this 
like this is the fact that when you delete the minus 30k region, it gets even more complex because uh, what you can do if you follow up with chip analysis of these other sites, delete the 30k region, if you look now at the ability of the vitamin D receptor to interact with the 10k region, it's strikingly reduced. Uh, there's a striking reduction at the 20k for CEBP beta and, uh, some, uh, and, and also some striking decrease in even RUNX activity at the promoter. So this seems to be a central organizing uh, 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 mediator of this particular gene. And I don't think these conclusions are terribly surprising, but at least they do show, uh, in fact, direct linkage. Now, uh, so where are we going with this? We have basically um, are introducing all these mutations into the mouse, and we're trying to look now to see what the consequence of that actually is. And I just want to show you one, one uh, set. We've deleted the minus 10K region in the mouse. And when you look at the cells that are derived in the skeleton that are derived, you can see, uh, in fact, a very similar uh, activity. And that is 125D3 in the wild type induces a strong upregulation of MMP13. But surprisingly, or perhaps not surprisingly, when you delete the minus 10K region, you lose the inducibility and you gain the suppressibility. So we think that this sort of uh, confirms what we've seen in the cell lines and we're hoping to see uh, uh, similar and perhaps more interesting things in the, in the mouse itself uh, with the other deletions. Now I want to just, uh, some, in the last few slides, I want to go to another uh, gene that we've studied. I'm not going to go through this in, in detail, uh, but this is a gene called rank ligand, which we've been studying for a number of years. Uh, rank ligand is extremely important because it's, uh, its upregulation mediates osteoporosis in almost every uh, osteoporotic disease state in humans, uh, as well in mice. Uh, its primary role is in bone, but there are many, many other activities that have been seen for this particular molecule. But the primary consequence of rank ligand knockout is a, a, a striking uh, phenotype in the mouse with respect to the skeleton. Now this just shows you uh, that rank ligand comes from the osteoblast, so it's part of the communication that goes on in remodeling. It comes and it's regulated from the osteoblast, but it promotes the osteoclast differentiation from hematopoietic cells. Now we originally did this work with CHIP CHIP a number of years ago, in fact 2004. This is actually a CHIP, um, a chip seq analysis in which we can see these similar vitamin D responsive regions. This is a gene that's regulated by 125, but we can identify a number of, of binding sites. And the important aspect here is in fact that there are four or five of them. Uh, and in fact, that the reason we could never identify a regulatory mechanism for this gene was in fact that, the, that in this particular case, this binding site is 23 kilobases upstream. Uh, and these sites are in fact about 88 kilobases upstream. So there's a whole cluster here, but they're, they're uh, broadly uh, uh, up, uh, up, up beyond the gene. Now, we've done a lot of work, and I'm not gonna go through this in detail, except to say that we know where there's a lot of binding proteins that are going on here in all of these, and we've actually classified these as two types. One, mesenchymal, or osteoblast-like enhancers from D1 to D6. Uh, and then we've actually identified hematopoietic uh, cells, uh, T and B cells that express rank ligand from an even more distal set between 123 and 157, uh, 53 uh, KB, even, even further upstream. And so these, and interestingly, D5 seems to be one that mediates both mesenchymal as well as uh, immune cell uh, activity. Now, this is just to show you that when we use that construct uh, or that segment that contains all this information, we can fully rescue this runty uh, rank ligand null mouse, which has all sorts of skeletal defects and all sorts of uh, lymph uh, organogenesis. There's a whole host of these things, but we can fully rescue virtually all of it. Uh, if we use smaller segments of this gene, uh, they are unable to rescue this, uh, uh, this mouse. So what we've done now is then, I'm not gonna go through this, but we've made four, uh, five genomic deletions in the mouse, one near the promoter where we deleted about seven kilobases, uh, and then some of these other regions that uh, 
that correspond to some of these enhancer regions. I've just summarized all the data here. I won't go through it uh, in detail to say that we've just finished the phenotyping of literally all of these, and each one of these has a basal, a regulatory, and a cell type specific uh, phenotype that is consistent with what we uh, had identified in the cells themselves. So let me summarize this by saying the vitamin D system represents a, uh, a good paradigm for the regulation of genes uh, by uh, systemic endocrine signals. The differentiation alters the epigenetic state. We think this is actually uh, very, very important. Uh, I've showed you a little bit of this section of the control of, of MMP13 uh, through direct linkage between enhancers and uh, the target gene. And then we've done a similar analysis with this rank ligand TNF uh, SF11 uh, gene that uh, is complicated, and we can actually see uh, reg distinct regulation in mesenchymal versus hematopoietic enhancers. And I will stop there. Thank you very much. It sounded from your talk like RXR might be pre-bound at VDR sites, or at least a subset of them. Yes. And at those sites where VDR joins in and RXR is pre-bound, do you see histone modification changes or not? So I, I, I would say that we haven't drilled down that deeply. But it's absolutely true that RxR appears to be marking these sites. We don't know the status of RxR, whether it's a homodimer, whether there's another nuclear receptor that's located there, uh, or, or what the role is. But, but years ago, we began to think that, in fact, the prebound RxR might be, play, a, play a role in perhaps even directing the vitamin D receptor to those sites, and that rather than forming in solution in the, in the cytoplasm. Yeah. 